war. It was always on the horizon along the no-man's land, separating Azerbaijan from neighboring rival Armenia. For example, maybe after two hours, we will attack. Maybe after two to one hour, uh, Armenians will do something, use artillery or other weapons. The two countries fought one another from 1988 to 1994 in a protracted, bloody conflict. 50,000 soldiers were killed, and over a million civilians displaced from their homes. A ceasefire was eventually signed. But when the dust settled, the Azerbaijani enclave of Karabakh fell into Armenian hands. I'm Uwe Shibander. My crew and I spent a year traveling to various parts of Azerbaijan and the front lines between it and Armenia in order to better get to know a region and a conflict often misunderstood by the outside world. The word Karabakh in Turkic means black orchards. The color of black in this culture denotes beauty and good fortune. But one night, stands out as truly a dark moment in Azerbaijani history. This man has never forgotten her roots. She remembers vividly what life in her hometown Khojila was like before the war changed everything. In 1992, I O dəhşətli gecədən əvvəldə çox Xocalıya çox hücumlar olurdu. Ermənilər kəndimizi top ateşinə tuturdular. Əlbəttə biz biz Xocalılar inanmırdıq ki ermənilər bizim torpağımızı alarlar. Bizim insanlarımızı qətlə yetirərlər, vəhşi cəsinə qətlə yetirərlər. Ağ qarın üstü sanki elə bil ki qırmızı yaylığa, lalələrə bəzənmişdi. Qızıl alqanın içində idi. Beneath the Azerbaijan countryside's raw beauty, countless similar stories of tragedy emerged. The Khojila massacre underscored just how Karabakh became one of the most fought over pieces of real estate in the world. Ermenler daha yaxşı, zengin şəkildə silahlanmışdılar. O cür müasir silahların qarşısında bizim o quş tüfəngi ilə onlarla mübarizə parmağımız təbii ki, böyük bir ciddi, böyük bir qəhrəmanlıq idi. Onlar ateş açanda, kənddə insanları vahimiyə salırdılar, borxuya salırdılar. Müharibə gedərkən düşmən tərəf, düşməndə bir hissiyyət olmur, yəni mərhəmət olmur düşməndə. İnsanları ancaq öldürüm, o cümlədən də ermənilərdə həmçinin mərhəmət yox idi. The war has now become a tense standoff. Here on the line of contact separating these two ancient adversaries, life goes on. On just the other side of this burn, the last major battle of the Karabakh War was fought. But today, the farmers here in these cotton fields are attempting to live their normal lives without the fear of artillery shells slamming into their fields or their families. Baku, the Azerbaijani capital, was once a little-known village where crude oil would spring from the ground on the far fringes of the Russian Empire. Nearly four decades ago, it was a city once on the verge of disaster. But today, with the benefit of natural gas riches and modernized infrastructure, officials here have vowed that the past will never repeat itself. In 2016, Fighting erupted in a brief four-day clash in Karabakh. And Azerbaijan's heavy investment in new military technology paid off on the battlefield. And in May 2018, Azerbaijan launched a surprise special operation high in the mountains of the autonomous Nakhchivan Republic. In both instances, Azerbaijan managed to retrieve some of its lost territory. The loss came as a shock to the Armenians. Azerbaijan hoped that the battlefield gains 
could lead to an upper hand in the negotiating table. Gün gelecek ve bugün işgal altında olan torpaklar azad olunandan sonra orada kaldırılacak Azerbaycan bayrağı azadlık meydana getirilecek ve her bir parada gösterilecek. The story from our side is that uh, you know Azeri uh, military totally unexpectedly um, began uh, shelling our positions and launched a, a, an all-out campaign. They have repeatedly said status quo is unacceptable. What the last escalation showed, it's not only unacceptable, it's unsustainable, it's impossible to keep it that way. So we, what we mean by change is the beginning of a comprehensive negotiation on a peace agreement, which would be very good. So for instance, I mean to begin gradual withdrawal from the occupied territories, refugees and IDPs are returned to their Developments. We resume normal relations with Armenia. Major General Hussein Mahmudov is Azerbaijan's chief military spokesman and a key architect in what his Ministry of Defense said were radical defense reforms meant to create a strong army that could one day regain occupied Karabakh. I'm sure uh, that when it comes to military balance, it's shifted to, towards Azerbaijan. You mentioned two major events uh, that happened over the last two, three years. It's uh, April events of 2016 and the recent operation in Nakhchivan. Uh, we succeeded to liberate Gunnut village and uh, altogether up to 1,000 uh, hectares uh, along the border between Nakhchivan, Autonomous Republic and uh, Armenia. And now we enjoy uh, the control over strategic uh, heights along this border. I am sure that uh, we really enjoying uh, advantage uh, of Armenia in every aspect of military balance. Armed forces is uh, number one priority for our government because uh, we know uh, in nowadays if you don't have force capable to face any sort of challenges and threats, you cannot provide. Uh, normalcy in your society. Unfortunately, it is true, uh, as I mentioned, because international law doesn't work and uh, we have to rely only on our might. The Azerbaijani military gave us exclusive access. It was eager to remind us that their forces were merely 70 kilometers from the Armenian capital of Yara. peace ever prevail here. But Azerbaijan and Armenia's positions in the Caucasus means that any future conflict will not likely remain contained. To give you a better idea on how the long simmering conflict between Azerbaijan and Armenia could potentially impact the entire region, we're here at the exact point where Armenia, Turkey, and Iran and Azerbaijan all meet at one point here at the border. As with so many conflicts in this part of the world, this one has its origins in a bitter, historical competition for existence. Alexander Dugin is a noted Russian political analyst and a strategist with close ties to the Kremlin. Of Armenians, separatists in Nagorno Karabakh, they have committed ethnical cleansing and they have destroyed and uh, put in exile all Azeris living there before. And while empires come and go, in Azerbaijan, the reverberations of Tsarist Russia and the Soviet Union's remapping of the Caucasus nearly a century ago are still being felt. As a professional historian, I can absolutely confirm the fact that Армения это является искусственным территориальным образованием на Южном Кавказе. Вся политика России в этом регионе была по большому счету имперской или империалистической. С этой целью началось активное переселение армян на Южный Кавказ, чтобы они были социальной опорой российской экспансионистской политики в этом регионе. Haidar Aliyev, who would become the future leader of Azerbaijan, was once a senior member of the Soviet Politburo, a 
the highest levels of power in Moscow. His return to the Azerbaijani enclave of Nakhchivan in 1992 was considered a pivotal moment for Azerbaijan's forces. He rallied the troops right when all seemed lost. Aliyev would stabilize the home front after months of infighting between competing Azerbaijani factions. And it was around that time, with Azerbaijan facing calamity on many fronts, that one American journalist who would grow close to Haider Aliyev found his way to Azerbaijan. Thomas Goltz describes himself as a rogue and accidental war correspondent. Fluent in both Turkish and Azeri, he was there and bore witness firsthand to the horrors of the Karabakh War. It's a long story. Um, I first arrived in Soviet Azerbaijan and by mistake, I was on my way to Soviet Uzbekistan and by a series of coincidences ended up in this place called Baku. This was uh, late June, early July 1991. A couple of really intense weeks here, got up to the Karabakh front, burning towns like a place called Chaikent, and even visited the late great president while he was in exile in Nakhchivan. Then the Soviet Union fell apart, starting with August 19th, 1991, and that's when the war really began. What's the genesis for this conflict between Azerbaijan and Armenia at its root cause? Territory. Easy as that, territory. It's all about lands. Yeah, I mean that some people would like to make it into a religious conflict. I've never believed that. Uh, it is about land as well as, what's the word I'm looking for, demographics. That the Tsarist Russians, back in the 19th century, started bringing in not just Armenians, but Germans and various others to replace the Muslim societies, Azerbaijani, Talush, Kurdish, and others, in the South Caucasus region. Thomas lost close friends in the war. His book, Azerbaijan Diaries, remains the definitive account of the conflict. We traveled with Thomas to the small town of Ugdum, situated right on the line of contact. It was in this region nearly 30 years ago, where his reporting was amongst the first to reveal to the world the atrocities committed in the Karabakh War. Nobody wanted to believe me. I'm counting bodies, literally counting bodies as they come in. And because I've been to Khojali on several occasions prior to this, uh, I knew the survivors as they were screaming in. They weren't lying to me. And when I finally sat down to write this report in shock, and managed to get a line out to the Washington Post. Nobody wanted to believe me. They said, no. Why not? Because the, the Armenians are always the victim. They're not the aggressor. This has subsequently been uh, proven to be uh, wrong in this instance. In my opinion, the Armenians had a consistent policy of ethnic cleansing. As a reminder of how close we were to the Armenian military positions, we were warned by our guides that it was not safe to stay long. As we interviewed Thomas, we could hear shelling in the distance. I was greeted with a scene of just utter chaos, utter chaos. People were streaming to the snow-covered mountains to get out or clawing onto our helicopter once we landed. Uh, so I spent the night and I did some more research and saw what was happening, but you know, it was, it was chaos. It was chaos, the place was falling. The only question was how could I get out? How did you get out? Once again, via helicopter, that waiting in despair and getting ready to walk up mountain. We cleared the mountain by something like five feet. That's when I decided that I was dead, or right before that. As we approached the mountain, the peak, to get over, I went through this ritual death. I said, you, know, you can throw yourself out and lessen the load so that everybody else on board might survive, or you can just pray or whatever. Anyway, we got over. The second helicopter did not. It smashed into the mountain and everybody was killed. 
abandoned buildings in Agdam, stand as a silent testimony to the war, the fate of their previous occupants unknown. Armenians and Azerbaijanis once lived side by side, lifelong neighbors, now perhaps mortal enemies. Yazman is a survivor, but the memories of the Khuzula massacre still haunt her. In 1992, her mother had stayed behind in her village, while Yazman fled with relatives. It was the last they would ever see of one another. Ermenler mənə nə verdi? Torpağım əlimdən aldı, evim aldı. Əzizlərimi aldı, valideynlərimi əsrət qoydu. Nə verdi? Mənə xəstəlik verdi. The war with Armenia has displaced tens of thousands of Azerbaijani families, many of whom now live in villages like this on the outskirts of Baku. In one family, three generations have been impacted by this conflict. And despite losing so much, they still remain hopeful that one day they can return back to their homeland. The very much local struggles of these families has now become ensnared in a broader geopolitical power play between world powers. Nevertheless, I would say, uh, in order to solve the Karabakh's problem, we need to exclude from it the West. So it is the Iranians are living near, Turks are living near. Uh, we are always uh, in, in, in engaged in, in, the, in this uh, zone. Uh, we consider that uh, the zone of our responsibility. Pushing back against Dugan's claims is Matt Briza, a former U.S. ambassador to Azerbaijan, who served as the U.S. co-chair of the Minsk Group, charged with the task of mediating a peaceful resolution to the Karabakh conflict. Self-evident to me that the South Caucasus are quite important strategically to the U.S., not simply be, uh, because Russia considers it such a vital region, uh, but because of, of course, the hydrocarbons, the oil and gas in Azerbaijan, um, because of also the, the, the being an area that's wedged between Russia and Iran, uh, because also the South Caucasus uh, have been a very useful transit point, very helpful into Afghanistan for, for the United States. Global energy markets are also impacted by this conflict. Europe's energy security will increasingly be reliant on Azerbaijan. The Baku Tbilisi Jehan pipeline was part of Aliyev's strategy to open Azerbaijan and its vast hydrocarbon resources for export to the West. The Baku Tbilisi Jehan pipeline is one of the most significant projects of its kind in the world, both in terms of scale and its strategic and economic role. Its completion and operational readiness sends out a strong message. Ilham Aliyev would eventually oversee an even more ambitious project, the European Southern Gas Corridor, which is set to be operational by 2020. That mega project will connect Azerbaijan's Shah Deniz field with Western Europe for the first time. As a result, Russia's near monopoly over Europe's energy supply will be seriously challenged. But geopolitics, sometimes makes for strange bedfellows. Russia has agreement with uh, Armenia, military agreement. But those uh, military agreement very clearly say that Russia would help Armenia if somebody attacks Armenian territory. But Russia recognizes that Nagorno-Karabakh is uh, territory of Azerbaijan. The conflict in the South Caucasus may be in Russia's backyard. But that's not going to stop Uncle Sam from getting involved. Driving home that point was U.S. President Donald Trump's hawkish national security advisor, dispatched to Azerbaijan and Armenia. Uh, extensive discussions about uh, major issues uh, in the region. Obviously, we talked about the uh, Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. We talked about uh, our efforts to stop uh, Iran's uh, malign behavior throughout the region. 
Azerbaijan's rich energy resources and location makes it key to U.S. interests. And with a vast Armenian diaspora, the U.S. policy attempts to walk a fine line. That the United States views the U.S.-Armenian relationship as being a top priority. Uh, this is a region that's uh, strategically important to the United States. But even old adversaries talk every now and then. Diplomats in Baku still hope that peace can one day be attained. So Armenian aggression against Azerbaijan continues, and Armenia still continues to occupy Azerbaijan's territories. Along the line of contact, Armenian and Azerbaijan soldiers are sitting face to face. But what has changed in Dushanbe? Uh, there was a Commonwealth of Independent States summit meeting. My president had a talk with Armenian Prime Minister. And Azerbaijan once again demonstrated it's in a constructive approach and good willing towards the resolution of the conflict. Really, if you look at the conflict, it reminds everyone a scenario of the First World War. And recently, we, uh, the international community, I mean, celebrated centenary of the end of the First World War. Yes. But unfortunately, the scenario of the First World War is uh, alive in the context of Armenia-Azerbaijan conflict. If peace does become a reality, can Armenians and Azerbaijanis ever live together side by side again? I do believe that ethnic reconciliation is possible. And it's possible, and therefore, it uh, demands a lot of uh, effort from both sides. The Armenians have installed a rump state in Karabakh that they call Artsakh. It is not recognized by the United Nations. Azerbaijan views it as an illegitimate entity. And the UN Security Council has called for Armenia to withdraw its forces from the occupied areas of Azerbaijan. But Armenia's insistence on gaining international recognition of occupied Karabakh remains a major point of contention. The assertion that Nagorno-Karabakh is an independent is yet another outright lie. Armenia was and still is directly responsible for the creation of the subordinate puppet regime. National sentiment runs deep and contributes to the impasse. If negotiation, war, military conflict is frozen. But if negotiation frozen, uh, it means that possibility for the military conflicts is uh, uh, open and uh, this conflict can uh, happen uh, again. But can wartime scars crisscrossing these two lands, bound by history and fate, ever fully heal? <laughs> When asked whether there is hope about the situation, the war, the relationship with Armenia or between Armenia and Azerbaijan, of course there is. I mean, Germany and France were arch enemies for centuries. And now look at the love affair that's happening between Paris and Berlin. So everything is possible. I don't foresee that happening with Armenia and Azerbaijan anytime soon, but it is possible. However, I'd like to remind you, where does the concept hope come from? It comes from Pandora's box, which was gifted to mankind as a result of the Titans in the Caucasus Mountains, not far from here, and after misery disease, despair, death, destruction. The gods left mankind one little thing at the bottom of Pandora's box, and that was hope.